Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service through a unique partnership with Alaska Public Media. It is Monday already, January 30th, 2023. February is knocking on the door. One more day to go. If you'd like additional weather information, go to weather.gov. Point and click forecast map allows you to go anywhere in the country to get the latest forecast, any relevant watches, warnings, or advisories, and so much more. The most interesting thing on the map uh, this Monday afternoon. Significant winter storm will impact areas of the southern plains up into the middle Mississippi Valley. Freezing rain, sleet, a quarter to a half an inch of freezing rain and sleet around Dallas, Fort Worth. Ice storm warnings are in effect for parts of Arkansas and to western Tennessee. Little Rock on over toward Memphis could see as much as a half inch of freezing rain, which is not good news for that area, especially along the I-40 corridor. But here, in Alaska, well, the lower middle Yukon Valley, the precipitation that's been around, that's going to be letting up here overnight into the day on Thursday. Some areas have picked up several inches of snow and even some icing in the lower Yukon Valley, but that's winding down. Winds will remain up along the Arctic coast uh, tonight into the day on Tuesday. Blowing snow, 30 to 40 mile an hour east northeast winds. And then um, areas of the panhandle are going to start to see some heavier precipitation and gusty winds on Thursday, especially the southern uh, southern and outer portion of the panhandle could catch some heavier precip then with a series of systems nothing major but impacting that area through the weekend and overall temperatures should cool down a bit across the northwest mainland as we get around and past the first several days of February rest of the state will generally see near normal temperatures though the southeast panhandle could see readings slightly above normal and taking a look at some of the images this afternoon Tanana up there in the uh, in the central Yukon Valley, light snow and fog, uh, as much as uh, four to near six inches of snow in that area from the far north. Utgiavik, well, we have the, finally have the low southern sun there and the temperature at uh, two below zero this afternoon. The breeze picking up, so there will be some uh, blowing snow developing there overnight and during the morning tomorrow. And then looking at uh, areas further down the Yukon River, St. Mary's has had some light snow and fog this afternoon, but areas around there did pick up some ice uh, as a result of frontal system that moved in with some warmer air. But uh, the winter storm warning in effect for that area will be allowed to expire at 6 p.m. this evening. And then finally, uh, on over toward all oh, the far north end, up around Bristol Bay, uh, north end of the Alaska Peninsula, Dillingham reporting drizzle and some fog temperature a bit above freezing at 34. Looking at the current uh, advisories warnings now until 6 p.m. winter storm warnings uh, for uh, Hooper Bay on up toward St. Mary's. Uh, uh, the area that includes Anvik till midnight, but again, precipitation is winding down. These advisories around Norton Sound going from Nome to the Strait all the way back towards St. Lawrence will be allowed to expire at 6. The advisories for the central interior, Galena through Tanana, Bettles, uh, even into Fairbanks through uh, Tuesday morning. But again, the snow still occurring on the light side will be gradually diminishing overnight and into the uh, day uh, morning hours of Tuesday. Along the Arctic coast, though, point Hope all the way through Utkiadvik East through Prudhoe Bay and Kaktovik. Brisk easterly winds will gust at times over 30 miles an hour. It will produce blowing snow and some reduced visibility. Well, on the satellite imagery, we have a system lifting out of the North Pacific that's going to be flinging more moisture on up toward the panhandle. And by Thursday, a little stronger system will bring some heavier precip to the southern panhandle. Meanwhile, to the west, we've had one frontal system push inland, another come ashore, and uh, we have yet another one back out here toward the central bearing and with trailing across areas of the Aleutian. And both the Gulf and areas of the Bering Sea will be uh, seeing uh, low pressure, nothing terribly strong, but some areas of low pressure that'll become more dominant as we go through this week, the weekend, and into early next week. So as we'd expect, though, at least uh, drier conditions across the north, though winds are brisk out of the east thanks to a pretty strong high pressure way up in the Arctic Ocean, and then we have generally lower pressure here in the Gulf, so it provides that uh, pressure gradient along there to keep the winds up. Uh, as of this afternoon, 
high pressure extending down into the Canadian Arctic coast. We have a low just south of the Gulf in the North Pacific. And then this front, this is the next front coming in off the Bering Sea. The one that came in earlier here over the course of the weekend is kind of troughed out and just that's what's left of that system. The precipitation along and ahead of it will gradually uh, diminish overnight and into the day on Tuesday. For uh, late tonight, early on Tuesday morning, we have the low uh, sitting out there over uh, the lower Gulf North Pacific interface frontal system pushing toward the panhandle. And then by Tuesday afternoon, uh, we have just a weak trough back here through the west. The low continues to sit there uh, in through the lower Gulf and uh, with the frontal boundary pushing inland with some uh, rain and snow, snow in the higher elevations. And then by Wednesday, uh, we can see this low out here in the central bearing with an occluded front working its way through the eastern Aleutians. Uh, here's the next low. That's the low that's going to bring heavier precipitation, especially to the southern panhandle as it spins on up back toward the north and west uh, as we go into early and midday Thursday, along with some gusty, perhaps gale force winds then there in the outer panhandle. Lows Tuesday morning will get below freezing here across much of the Kenai Peninsula, Anchorage Bowl northward. Still above freezing outer areas of the panhandle, including Sitka and Craig. Highs on Tuesday, no real change. Uh, lower 40s along areas of the outer and southern panhandle. A little above freezing in the north. Um, temperatures will be near or just below freezing from about Anchorage southward. And then uh, lows again, generally above freezing in the southern and outer panhandle. But uh, colder temperatures could be around three below Glen Allen. They're in through the Copper River Basin and temperatures a little cooler here midweek, below freezing, especially from the western Kenai northward up through uh, Talkeetna. But readings continue to be fairly stable there through the southern portion of the panhandle. Uh, coldest temperatures will be here in the northeast Arctic Village, uh, Fort Yukon, uh, areas like Kaptovik could be around 20 below or so. Brisk east winds along the coast. Daytime highs sub-zero along the north slope Arctic coast in areas of the northeast and uh, east central Alcan border, Yukon Flats. But back here along Norton Sound, uh, Nome down through uh, Imanok, uh, looking at temperatures mid to perhaps upper 20s. Lows again uh, chilly there in the northeast, 26 below. Uh, forecast low for Arctic Village on Wednesday morning with daytime highs staying below zero along the north slope Arctic coast in through the northeast uh, portion of the interior. And readings a little cooler. We're going to see this area kind of cool down a bit here, I think, as we uh, head through uh, the first and second week of February. In through the southwest below freezing temperatures in the morning, but daytime highs should generally be around or a bit above freezing from the Alaska range down through the uh, uh, Alaska Peninsula and, of course, through the Aleutians. And then uh, Wednesday morning lows, uh, we could see a few single digits readings further up the Yukon, upper Kuskokwim Basin. But otherwise, uh, we expect temperatures to be just a little cooler. Uh, Dillingham and King Salmon getting back down in, into the mid-upper 20s. Quick check here of the temperature outlook, uh, 6 to 10-day outlook, February 5th through February 9th. Cooling down across the northwest portion of the mainland, a little above normal in the panhandle, and then precipitation is expected to average a little above normal here uh, the southern mainland and uh, maybe a little more so there in through the panhandle with a little drier conditions in the far northeast up there along the eastern arctic coast and now aviation weather around alaska it's time for your aviation weather. The main thing to keep in mind, we're not going to have any really powerful storms coming up here in the shorter term, though uh, low pressure will be returning out across the Gulf with waves of energy kind of pulling back from southeast to northwest. Also, we're going to start to see uh, well areas of low pressure lifting out of the North Pacific back up into the Bering. We already have one frontal system uh, working its way in through the western interior uh, Tuesday morning with some areas of light uh, snow mixed with a little freezing rain or uh, freezing drizzle in some areas and another uh, secondary front kind of pushing in toward the southwest coast as we go into Tuesday afternoon. Widespread IFR across the Gulf, Panhandle, and again across areas of uh, the west, western Alaska range. And uh, Tuesday afternoon, we expect those IFR conditions to continue, maybe uh, letting up a little bit through the central southern Panhandle inner channels, uh, MVFR. But IFR across the Gulf and then back up here, uh, west side of the Alaska range up through uh, Norton Sound, uh, 
the Seward Peninsula, Kotzebue Sound, uh, St. Lawrence, and Nunavik Islands, another area of IFR associated with low pressure uh, that will be lifting across the west central portion of the Aleutians. And then as that system works its way eastward, the low will lift up into the central portions of the bearing with a trailing front IFR there and through the central, pushing in in the eastern Aleutians. Widespread IFR anticipated here across the southwest, west central areas of the state, same places around Norton Sound on up through the Seward Peninsula. Uh, scattered pockets in areas of south central, up the western Kenai, perhaps along the Alcan border in the southeast interior, and then along uh, the intercoastal mountains, northern parts of the Panhandle. And for Wednesday afternoon, uh, still IFR conditions along the intercoastal mountains of the Panhandle in the far north, and also out extending out along uh, the YK deltas, especially out over the central northern bearing. And as far as pass conditions are concerned, Anatovic Pass, as well as Adigan Pass, will see VFR conditions there up along, especially the eastern half of the Brooks Range for Tuesday. Further south and west, though, where that moisture is and some lighter precipitation, Lake Clark and Merrill will see IFR conditions prevail, as will Rainy Pass. And even as we round up through the central eastern Alaska Range, Windy Pass, IFR to start out Tuesday, giving way to MVFR conditions. Isabel, the same thing, a fair amount of IFR conditions from around uh, Isabel Pass west and southwestward, giving way to MVFR conditions as the day unfolds. Uh, Mentasta Pass may see IFR conditions in the morning, giving way to VFR conditions, a little drier air that way. And then uh, Tanita Pass, IFR becoming MVFR uh, during the day on Tuesday. And further south and west, Portage Pass, uh, MVFR to start Tuesday. Uh, but along the past and just north of there, uh, be trying to become VFR, I think uh, IFR conditions will persist further uh, to the south there in the Kenai Peninsula along the Chugach Mountains. And then finally, the far northern panhandle. Look for IFR conditions to hold at Chilkoot and White, and for that matter, much of the panhandle on Tuesday. Freezing levels aloft are as high as two, 4,000 feet here in the Gulf. You have to go south of Haida Gwaii and off the British Columbia coast before they get back up to 6,000 feet. There was a pretty strong ridge of high pressure over the weekend. That feature has kind of uh, retreated and collapsed southeastward, so not quite as strong as what we were seeing. Uh, surface freezing line runs up well into the northern uh, bearing across the southwest coast uh, through central Cook Inlet uh, along the northern Gulf Coast in through the inner channels of the Panhandle. Uh, greatest threat for icing, some moderate icing along areas of the west from that frontal boundary that's pushed inland above 2,000 feet there in the, toward the middle Yukon River. Areas along the Panhandle above 4,000 feet, especially the south and western uh, areas off the coast. And then also, as south of Kodiak Island, above 4,000 feet, and then behind me here with that area of low pressure and precipitation associated with that, above 4,000 feet, portions of the central western Aleutians. At the jet stream level, 30,000 feet, uh, weak high pressure circulation right over Prince William Sound. Strongest winds are behind me with that low coming up out of the North Pacific toward the uh, western half of the Aleutians. At 700 millibars, relatively quiet winds across uh, the mainland. A couple of low circulations, one in the southeast Gulf. Another one behind me here, as I mentioned, uh, is bringing in that next uh, area of low pressure and frontal system. Finally, 3,000 feet, uh, we see uh, some winds that are coming in off the Alaska Peninsula, north 40 knots, and then the strongest winds here in the central Aleutians, upwards of 55 to 70 knots. The greatest threat for turbulence, pocket there in the central uh, areas of the Yukon Valley, and then again across Alaska Peninsula, in through the Aleutians, you'll see areas of moderate turbulence surface to 4,000 feet. Hello and welcome to this edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Carrie Hazley, Chief of the Emergency Services and Multimedia Branch for the National Weather Service in Anchorage. With me today I have Dr. Doug Wesley, a physical scientist for the National Weather Service Alaska Region Headquarters. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Carrie. Hello. Hello. So you're here to talk to us a little bit about something called COCORAS, which is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. And I understand that COCORAS is a network of volunteers who take weather observations. Can you tell us a little bit more about what COCORAS is? Yes, it, it began in the lower 48, oh, 20, 20 some years ago, and it's expanded during those two decades. Uh, they're getting something like 10 to 15,000 rainfall reports per day from the lower 48. 
Wow, that's a lot of different reports. So how many reports do we get in Alaska right now? Well, you know, it varies uh, maybe 10 to 25. Uh, but if you consider the large areas we're talking about, uh, we have a lot of gaps to fill. Uh, you know, any observation is better than no observation, but um, there are large areas in Alaska. Alaska covers uh, three, 3 million square miles. There's a lot of data gaps in that space. So we'd like to enhance it. Sure. So tell us then a bit about why these observations are so important to Alaska and, and why we need to expand the number of them that we're getting. Yes, Alaska, as, as you know, has large areas with a lot of complex terrain and there are no weather ob observing stations or radar. So COCORAS can help fill the data gaps uh, so you can at least get some idea of what's actually falling from the sky at those locations. COCORAS increases the amount of timely weather, weather observations available to meteorologists and other decision makers, especially in hazardous type of weather, uh, both rain and snow and, and the occasional hailstorm that we get up here. Uh, COCORAS observations can help forecast identify long-term precipitation and snowfall trends in, in a climate sense. And just overall, they increase the amount of timely weather observations available to the public. So then let's talk a little bit about each of the different types of observations. So it's the rain, hail, and snow network. So let's start by talking a little bit about rain observations and tell us a little bit about how you take those and how long it takes a volunteer to get a rain observation. Okay, this is a four inch gauge, uh, just just the basic gauge, which you use for both rain and snowfall. Um, but the rain observations are, are pretty quick. It's a matter of two or three minutes that each volunteer goes out and takes a reading. And then uh, they enter these on the computer and they're immediately available uh, for, for observation on the computer um, and on the maps so that you can see, see your report. The, in the wintertime, it's a little bit more complicated um, we require the observers to measure not only the snow accumulation, but also the liquid equivalent. So they've got to melt the snowfall. And this involves two of these gauges and a snowboard. And it's, you know, it, it's uh, maybe a 10 minute observation per day during the winter. But the snowfall is so variable that even across town and, and in especially remote areas, it's, uh, it's crucial that we increase this, this number of snow observations in the network. Right. I understand that we can only take observations in places where we have weather service offices. And so we rely on all of these volunteers to help us fill gaps. And it's also interesting to know how snowfall varies across like large spaces or even small cities. So I noticed here in Anchorage, for example, we can have a vastly different amount of snow on the east side of town and the west side of town. And so it seems like these observations would help us to better understand what's going on in places besides just where the office is. That's correct. Uh, you know, in any given snowfall, there are, there are typically large variances, as you know. And, uh, you know, we rely on reports from the public and from, from National Weather Service cooperative spotters to, to uh, map out the snowfall that occurs so that we can predict it better in the future. Sure. So we talked about rain observations and we talked about snow observations. And you said for each of those, um, if it's rain, it only takes a couple minutes and then it can take about 10 minutes if it's snow. Hail was the other one that we didn't talk about yet. Tell us just a little bit about the hail observations that Kokoraz observers take. Yeah, the Kokoraz network, um, it, it has a hail pad and it's just a simple um, block of styrofoam covered with aluminum foil and you can approximate the size of hail by measuring the, the dent that the hail causes on the pad and this can give us an estimate of hail size. We don't get hail very often in Alaska but I've seen it two or three times in my five years in Anchorage and uh, and some of it up to a half inch. Uh, and I'm sure there's been larger hail up in the interior at times. So let's talk a little bit about how these uh, rain, hail, and snow observations can help forecasters. So we have people who forecast the weather, and we also have people who work on the hydrology side. And I can see that maybe Kokoraz would be beneficial to both of them. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, uh, it's beneficial to, to the hydro, hydrologic forecaster who's 
concern about flooding and, and uh, rainfall is, a, is comprises uh, uh, one of the causes of a flood and, or it can exacerbate high water conditions. So the more the hydrologist has to look at in terms of data from recent rainfall, the more information they have to work with when they're generating forecast. Um, you know, the, the weather forecasters in the wintertime uh, at the Weather Service office can use these observations also to, to help with past case studies, to, to verify model data, and to get a handle on, on what's actually happening out the window. And that's important in the forecast process. Yeah, it seems like you can never have too much information when you're you're issuing a forecast. So it only takes a few minutes most of the time to take these observations. So let's say I'm interested in becoming a volunteer for Cocoraz. How do I get involved? Yeah, the, the website is very useful, cocoraz.org, and uh, it has a number of video-based uh, training um, tutorials that take you right on from, from measuring rainfall to a video tutorial on measuring snowfall. Um, it, it has the maps available in real time and you can go back and look at that, that old data too through those maps. And so it's a very useful comprehensive website. Very interesting and anybody can get involved, right? You don't have to be a meteorologist. That's right, and you know we we love to have 24, uh, well, once a day reports throughout the year. But if you can't, then then so be it. And uh, we have observers. Some observers are out of town for periods of time, or um, maybe maybe they they can only re report uh, you know a week or two of precipitation. But it's still useful. It's still data that we look at. So uh, the more the better. But but you can get involved even if you you aren't at a location. Uh, 24-7. Doug, I really appreciate you coming on to our program today to talk about Coco Raz. Hopefully we can have you back in the studio at some point so we can talk more about it and then talk more about the different types of observations and the tools that observers use. Um, that would be great, yeah. So thank you for your time and thank you so much for joining this edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back, and we're in the home stretch of our show, the marine weather segment, and we'll start with the sea ice edge. Ice is extensive across the Arctic coast through the Chukchi Sea and Bering Strait, though there are a few areas where we've seen some plenty as an openings develop east side here of Norton Sound, and there just to the uh, north and northwest of uh, Shishmaref. As we go further south, even some melting of the ice down here along in the edge of it, there through uh, Bristol and Kuskokwim Bays, though we're not expecting any more southward of advancement of the ice, at least for the time being. And looking at the marine forecast for the panhandle here coming up uh, for Tuesday, uh, winds will generally be uh, light variable. Lynn Canal, five knots, waves a couple few feet. Southeast winds pick up to 25 knots, Dixon entrance, and uh, waves perhaps up about five feet. The areas uh, from Craig north through Sitka, off of Sitka, 25 to 30 knot uh, south, and then winds turning more easterly, and then there can continuing easterly 20 to 25 knots, Yakutat westward, waves generally running from anywhere from seven to as high as 10 feet. On Wednesday, look for winds to uh, pick up out of the north in Lynn Canal at 30 knots with six foot waves, northeasterly 25 knots, Petersburg five foot waves, and then the entrance uh, there, Dixon entrance 20 knots, southeast waves, four foot waves, the outer Gulf Coast, south winds turning easterly at about 20 to 25 knots, south of Gustavus and 15 to 20 knots from the east with eight to 10 foot waves Yakutat westward. Across the northwestern Gulf, Cook Inlet, Prince William Sound, relatively light winds Tuesday, north winds 10 knots in Prince William Sound, two foot waves. Uh, in Cook Inlet, variable winds around 10 knots at Kinnit and uh, as well as Turnigan Arms, but uh, turning northwesterly at the entrance there at 15 knots with waves a few feet. And on Wednesday, variable winds around 10 knots in Prince William Sound as well as upper Cook Inlet with waves 
a foot or two at best. And winds will be northwesterly coming out of Cook uh, Inlet at 25 knots with waves of six feet or so. Across uh, Kodiak Island on Tuesday, winds will be northwesterly 20 to 25 knots. They will tend to increase and become west-northwesterly 30 knots uh, either side here of the Alaska Peninsula with waves as high as nine to 11 feet on the North Pacific side and as much as nine feet north of Cold Bay. Uh, come Wednesday, uh, winds will generally be out of the west-northwest 20 to 25 knots around Kodiak Island but look for them to turn back toward the south and southeast in advance of the next front, especially from Sandpoint uh, areas southwestward waves. Nine feet on the North Pacific side, uh, five feet ice-free areas of Bristol Bay, and uh, eight feet there north of Cold Bay. Uh, across the Aleutian chain on Tuesday, winds will be west-northwest, 25, 30 knots around Dutch Harbor and the eastern Aleutians, but once you get around ATCA westward through ADAC to Kiska, 40 knots south winds, waves uh, as high as 15 to 18 feet on the North Pacific side out there. And then on uh, Wednesday, we expect uh, winds to be southerly in the far eastern Aleutians to 30 knots, turning west, northwest around 30 knots in the wake of that frontal system. And waves generally running, oh, 12 to 14 feet on the North Pacific side. And once you're away from the shelter of the islands, uh, waves running upwards around 16 feet there north of Atka. And then across the southwest coast up through through Norton Sound uh, around the southern side of St. Lawrence, ice in place, winds somewhat variable, uh, 10 to 15 knots as we get out into any open water south of St. Matthew, south winds 15 knots, waves as high as 18 feet, and uh, west winds 20 knots with 12 foot waves around St. Paul, St. George. On Wednesday, as it's a little more compact, a little works its way up into the central bearing, we're gonna see winds turn offshore easterly, 10 knots out of Norton Sound, upwards to 30 knots, uh, north of Nunavik Island and as high as 35 knot northeast uh, gales there at St. Matthew and southeast gales to 35 knots with waves where there is open water running around 14 feet. And finally along the Arctic coast, 30 knot east winds, Kaptovik down through uh, Point Lay uh, falling off to south winds, the lower Chukchi Sea to 15 knots through the Bering Strait. And then on Wednesday, winds will come down slightly, uh, 25 knot easterly winds along the Arctic coast all the way down through uh, Point lay falling off to east southeast winds around 15 knots in the lower Chukchi Sea and easterly winds south of the Bering Strait off of uh, the western portion of the uh, Seward Peninsula. We anticipate winds to be about 20 knots there in the north side of uh, St. Lawrence Island. So late tonight we have a low pressure in the Gulf, one little frontal system pushing on through a couple of weakening troughs from the western mainland and then on Tuesday here's that more compact low that'll be lifting out of the central Bering. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.